Okay, we might as well um, go ahead and get started. Thank you very much, everyone who's here. So this is our last in our set of three um, lunchtime presentations from the Pilbury, Pilbara Marine Conservation Partnership. And today we're lucky enough to have Professor Ryan Lowe from UWA and Dr. Fabio Bacchetti from CSIRO to talk to us about their, the larger program around environmental drivers. So Ryan will start off with talking about some of the environmental drivers and pressures and hydrodynamics of the Pilbara region, and then that will be followed by Fabio talking more about connectivity across the region. And I will simply hand it over to the two of them. So I'm stuck with having to use my computer. No, come on. All right, thanks everybody. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, work that we've been doing looking at the ocean processes that affect coastal ecosystems in the, the Pilbara and Ningaloo region. Um, and really, the focus of this short talk is really going to be targeting you know, what are the extreme um, drivers, particularly focusing on marine heat waves and um, tropical cyclones. And so this is work that's part of the, the Pilbara Marine Conservation um, Partnership <clears throat> with additional support through the ARC Center of Excellence <coughs> for Coral Reef Studies and uh, the ARC Linkage Project. <coughs> so really over the last almost 10 years now, we've been studying reefs up in the, the Northwest. Um, and really understanding the background conditions that drive things like circulation within, you know, at the scale of reefs, the exchange of water between the deep ocean and, and reef systems. Um, and what's been well known now is, is how, you know, if we think about waves um, in the west coast and places like Ningaloo that are wave exposed, how waves drive the circulation of these kind of reef systems. And then the other extreme, you know, through WAMSI work and, and other work up in the Kimberley where we get extreme tides that are, are driving a lot of the hydrodynamics. And so the Pilbara, I mean, there's probably a whole talk on sort of the, the normal background kind of um, processes that occur on the reefs in the Pilbara. It's sort of this transition going from wave dominated to, to tide dominated as the tidal regime increases. Um, what I want to really focus on today is that, you know, these extreme events that can very rapidly have you know, substantial impacts on, on um, coastal ecosystems, coral reefs, and talk really about, as I said, marine heat waves. Um, and in tropical cyclones. So I'll sort of just um, talk a bit about different parts of the, the work, and I'm happy to, to talk more later in more detail about um, aspects of it. So one of the things we've been doing is, is and this is really a motivation, <coughs> showing, you know, as we know, we've been seeing um, quite a number of um, extreme uh, warming events along the entire WA coast in, in recent years. And so one of the things we've been looking at is when you have, um, as we know, La Nina conditions, we usually get warm water. Um, and I'll talk about reasons why. Um, you know, you can see in this example, this is the 2010-2011, which really was unprecedented in terms of the warming along the entire West Coast. Um, but we also had a, a La Nina event during the summer of 2012, um, 2013. that was comparable in terms of scale. But as you can see, the, the temperature patterns were dramatically um, different. And one of the things we want to do is look at, at the scale of you know, the Pilbara and the coastal region. What are the impacts of those differences and what actually drove those differences when you have two um, similar climate events? And then I also want to just talk briefly about the other kind of major climate phase, which is um, El Nino's, which was really globally unpre um, unprecedented in many levels, was the 2015-2016 event. So if we look at, um, so we had two, two relatively strong La Nina events. If we look at the differences, um, and you know, the 2010-2011 the event, which was well documented, as I mentioned, it really affected and created um, extreme temperatures from really Ningaloo, Northwest Cape, um, south. So places in Ningaloo experienced some of the, the first kind of severe bleaching and, and um, large areas. Um, and, and of course, further south, um, all the way down into the southwest, not just coral reefs, but other ecosystems. Um, but if we look at you know, the similar, and we contrast that with a similar um, period in 2012-2013, um, where, whereas we saw no major bleaching really in the, in the Pilbara during this first event, we saw um, 
by most accounts, the, the most severe bleaching that occurred in recent years in the Pilbara occurred during this 2012-2013 um, period. And you know, some places there's some documentation that says that you know, in areas up to 60% of coral cover was was lost. And so one of the things we've been doing is trying to understand why we see these these differences. So, so you know, you can imagine like six months in advance, you know, there's a La Nina event coming. Why do we expect, you know, the Pilbara, what's going to happen to the Pilbara, for example? Um, and so this gets at this idea that if we think about coastal warming events um, and these extreme events, there's really two ways you can warm the, the coastal regions. One is you can have warm water moving down a coastline. So tropical warm water, if it's going flowing south, it can it contributes to warming a region. And you can also have air-sea heat exchange due to atmospheric heat transfer into the ocean. They can also um, drive that warming. And so if we think about, and this, this event has been well studied, the 2010-2011, what drove the warming along the, the WA coast. In large part, this was driven by, during La Nina conditions, and particularly really strong La Ninas, we get much stronger low and current. We get much stronger advection or movement of warm water from the tropics. Um, down the coastline. And so the main driver of this heat wave along the entire um, west coast was essentially the Lewin current strengthening and, and moving that tropical heat um, down the coastline. And this is just work some Jessica Benth Benthusen did, you know, showing that of the temperature anomalies along the west coast, a lot of it can be just simply explained by not, not the atmospheric heating that's occurring, but actually the warm water moving down um, the coast. But the important thing is the Lewin current itself, it forms and really consolidates right around the Northwest Cape. So it's not, the, in the Pilbara, we don't see this, this strong, um, strong effect. So one of the things we've been doing is looking at what, what caused that extreme warming event in the coastal um, Pilbara region during that La Nina period. And sort of a number of details, which I won't go into, but Basically, we set up um, high-resolution hydrodynamic models and, and also that the capture the, the thermodynamics um, that, that, that drives temperature variability. And we looked at these two events. And really, the main, dry, the main difference during these two periods was um, during these line Indies, we had strong low and current moving tropical heat down the coast, which is not shown here. But you can get the warming down in the, the, the rates of warming were high down in the Ningaloo South. But you can see the main difference is we saw a lot of warming in the inshore Pilbara during this period. It's not due to actual um, water being transported down the coast. It's actually anomalous weather conditions that kind of coincided where we had a lot of cloud-free days and a lot of intense um, heating. So, so the, the heat wave in the Pilbara was actually atmospheric driven. It was due to the, the warming of the of the, the coastal region. So um, this makes it more challenging to really predict what is going to happen during these kind of climate cycles in this Pilbara region. Um, so the other thing just to briefly talk about is the other climate phase. So we have um, El Nino conditions, which on a large scale kind of create the opposite um, patterns. And we had a, you know, the quite spectacular event in 2015. 2016, which a number of um, people in the state were involved in um, looking at the, the event. So this is a paper, Nature, with a number of people in, in Department of Parks and Wildlife, UWA, and, and, and Ames, um, led by Terry Hughes. And so initially, for those who were involved in the event, you know, six months in advance, there was it was predicted there was going to be a massive warming over the whole region, would affect Ningaloo and so on. Um, because these El Nino events really tend to create really warm pools of water uh, around northern Australia. But what we found is that the, really the, only the northern parts of, of um, uh, WA, the, the Kimberley and places like Scott Reef and so on, but the Pilbara area was, was not bleached, although we expect initially there, there would have been this warming. And so we started to look more in detail at what, you know, why during these El Nino conditions we didn't have this warming. I won't really go into all the, the details. Um, does that work? No, it's not, not working. Press, press it on the screen. Sometimes. 
some reason if the hand on the screen. I think it says QuickTime not, not available. That's, that's all right. Um, what you could see if it worked was um, we had basically a, a large pool of water warming in the, the northwest that would have extend, you know, growing and building and extending all the way down um, <clears throat> towards the Pilbara and Ningaloo. It's too bad. We have a, a movie where we actually look at the, the, the temperature in the, in the southern parts, Raleigh Shoals in the south, and we actually had a, at a perfect time a tropical cyclone stand which came through and cooled this whole region massively. So there's evidence that during this really in strong El Nino event, we would have had quite a bit of warming, um, all extending all the way down um, into, the, into the Pilbara. So if I jump back, I guess, to here, the main kind of conclusion is that we have these really large scale um, climate events that, like the, Lewin, the during La Nina periods, we tend to get warming, clear warming, Mingaloo South. Um, during El Nino, it's tending to favor the warming of, on the northwest and the far northwest. And this Pilbara area is a, this transition period that's a transition region that can um, kind of experience these warming events, at, you know, on both times depending on the, the local kind of conditions that are um, established. And so in many ways, predicting what happens in the Kimberley, Kimberley to these climate-driven events is, is by far the most um, challenging. Okay, so the other thing I want to now talk about is, so I mentioned tropical cyclones and maybe a positive benefit of having a cyclone come through in terms of cooling, and I didn't, the, if I showed that movie, the, these cooling events can last for weeks to even a month. You can see some evidence of those. Um, but cyclones obviously do a lot of damage to coastal ecosystems um, as well. Um, and so the Pilbara, as all of us know, it's one of the most um, globally one of you know hotspot of, of cyclones. And, and what's shown here is these dots are where we have cyclones crossing the coastline. And so there's this. Um, area of the Pilbara that receives by far in Australia the most um, cyclone crossings and they tend to be the most um, um, frequently the most severe. So on average we get you know a couple large <laughs> tropical cyclones usually crossing the, the coastline of the Pilbara um, each year and we really wanted to understand what are the impacts um, on the coastal regions um, to these large um, tropical cyclone events. This probably won't work either. No, that's all right. Um, so what we have been doing, and this is work that was sort of separate through a, initially started through an ARC linkage project where we were looking at understanding the, 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 the waves and how waves, the extreme waves that are generated due to tropical um, cyclones in the Northwest. Um, and how looking at historical cyclones, a number of large historical cyclones through the last um, 20 years, how the different characteristics, how they propagate the intensity, and then so on, how that um, drives the, the wave conditions. So this, let me see if it actually... Oh, it does work. Okay, so this is just showing an example of, um, at a regional scale, um, this is Tropical Cyclone Olwyn in 2015, um, <clears throat> that you can see directly impacted the, the Pilbara and, and, and crossed um, uh, Ningaloo. And so one of the things we've been, been doing is, is developing these large-scale regional models to predict cyclone waves. And the focus of this work I'll talk about is really what are the how do these actually impact when we get into the coastline, and in particular reef um, coastlines. And that's not mine. There's one next to it. Yeah, that one. Okay, so one of the, I mean, really exceptional opportunities we had is we, for a number of years, we were putting out instruments along parts of the reef up in the, the Ningaloo and going up into the Pilbara region, seeing if we would ever get a direct impact of a, of a tropical cyclone, just to look at the, the impacts it does to a, to a reef system. Um, and we had instruments out during um, tropical cyclone Olwyn in um, 
2015 that you know this is showing Tantabidi where we had a number of, of um, instruments me measuring waves um, and also had a lot of surveys before of what the coastline was and the uh, both the the bathymetry and the in the the beach um, topography and we had a direct hit as you can see here so this is the model the wave model I showed um, with you know up to 10 meter high waves um, generated right before it um, impacted at at Ningaloo. And the waves with all tropical cyclones, you get the strongest waves are on the left side. So we still, you know, only got about six meter high waves because the eye, the eye basically passed over right over Tandabiti where we were doing the field work, but the strong waves were on the, the left side. So we still got very large waves. So what's shown here is the, the wave heights on the four reefs, so offshore. And then these are the wave heights on the reef. And so you can immediately see that the actual reef itself just dramatically um, reduces the waves as they, they break on top of the, the reef. And so a lot of work we've done, been doing since then is actually understanding the damage that was caused by, by oil wind around parts of, of Kingaloo, um, understanding areas that we saw um, you know, significant um, uh, or differences in, in erosion. And one of the, I think, the important um, findings was that we, we do see patterns of erosion that depends on the presence of reefs and, and gaps. But what we've been finding is if we look at the whole coastline, you know, if we average over a reasonable part of the coastline, there's really no net erosion. It's just really redistributing sediment from behind reefs and, and channels and so on. So in this case, for example, in the back of, this is Tandabidi, which we studied, um, there was a bit of erosion on this side of, uh, of um, what's called the salient here, but that, that sand was, um, we just saw an increase in the beach, beach width on, on this side. And so what we did is we looked at a number of these uh, beaches behind um, these reefs at Ningaloo. And what's shown here is the, the volume change, the beach volume change um, behind these reefs. And you can see pretty much no no changes. So, so in terms of we have a you know a category three, almost category four cyclone direct hit going right over a site, and there's no um, beach erosion. Also, very little damage to the actual from accounts with you know people in Nepal and so on about damage to the actual um, reef communities themselves. If we compare that then to what people find on coastlines without reefs. Um, and a lot of this data we looked at was from like the Gulf of Mexico and so on, where you just see you know catastrophic erosion events of you know. So so the presence of these reefs has a very impressive capacity to kind of not only reduce the waves but also reduce um, the erosion that, that occurs. And so you know quite a bit of work we're still doing is looking at how to actually model these events. The last thing I just want to talk about um, briefly is the other sort of major influence on you know, tropical cyclones that is a much larger scale phenomena is when we have, um, as I'll show, when we have these really large cyclone events, they're um, creating large waves over the whole really coastal northwest shelf region, stirring up a lot of um, sediment. And so one of the things we wanted to do is look at during these cyclones, how do these cyclones drive um, large turbidity events and really contrast that with other um, drivers such as you know normal kind of tidal condition, mm -hmm. wind driven currents, um, local river discharge. So you can see this is some work by Peter Ferns' group where you can see the Ashburton discharging some, some sediment. Um, and also, you know, also putting this in the context of, of, of dredging events, so anthropogenic events. And so one of the things we've done, and so this is sort of continuing, this is work by um, Francois, who's at the, um, with some support from the ARC Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies, that if we look at a number of um, long-term data sets, so this is ultimately from, from Wheatstone, looking at what drives the, the turbidity um, variability across the whole Pilbara region. What's essentially shown here, this is called empirical orthogonal functions. So the basic idea is that 
these are where we had measurements of turbidity. You can see this is this the magnitude of this controls the amplitude. If we multiply it by this time series here, we can get a measure of the, the variability. And so what we find is that most of the variability occurs in the coastal regions of the Pilbara. But if we look at the amplitude and the, the extremes of these turbidity events, you'll see immediately this the black lines are the sort of the amplitudes. You can see these extreme events. So this is Cyclone Iggy and Cyclone Norell. And you can see they very strongly correlate with, with the local wave um, conditions that occurred. So what we've been doing is looking back through time. So this is some work, um, a product from Peter Ferns through the Wemsey Dredging Project, which he's provided as an output, looking going back much further and looking at historically these major um, turbidity events, which you can see essentially these black lines. So we can see all these big spikes. And we track that to you know historical cyclones and also the proximity of cyclones to the to the region, and you can see pretty much all of the major large scale kind of turbidity events are driven by these um, these tropical cyclones, and they're really stirring up sediment, you know, up to about 50 to 100 meters um, depth. And this is the, just the last slide. Um, and so one of the things we're doing now is, is actually looking at, at modeling these events. So taking the, the, the models of the, the hydrodynamics, the cyclone wave predictions. Um, and you can see an example from, from Iggy where we can see the extreme you know, large waves. Um, but the cyclones do two things. They stir up the sediment. The large waves are stirring up sediment and suspending it. But they also drive really strong wind-driven currents. And this is just showing an example of, of, of Iggy where we have a big, you know, the waves are stirring up sediment and then we're getting sediment moving strongly down the, the coastline. You can see the extent of this. So this is actually showing predictions of the suspended sediment concentrations during Iggy, which is influencing this whole broad region. And then you can see, you know, calibration or um, comparison with um, MODIS imagery that's, that's calibrated for the... Um, environment. So just to summarize, we're sort of looking at, I'm just talking about little um, bits of this, this research, but one of the sort of major findings is I think we have a pretty good understanding of what drives, at least at a large scale, these, these um, extreme warming events. But the really tricky part is what happens in this Pilbara region, um, because it's a transition zone and it depends on particular weather conditions that occur. Um, talked about the impacts and what the physical damage caused by, by tropical cyclones and how at least parts of the, the Pilbara that are protected by reefs seem very resilient to these major tropical cyclone impacts. Um, and then also talked about another negative aspect of, of these cyclones is stirring up sediments in the scale. I mean, we're talking, when we put this in the context of a dredging event that is, you know, localized, we're talking, this is over hundreds, up to, you know, a thousand kilometers where we can stir up all the sediments um, on the northwest shelf. And so we're looking at this in, in more detail. And which I haven't talked about in terms of local river input, mostly through the Ashburton and the flood plumes and so on, that seems to be a very li limited impact. It's only sort of confined to the, the near coastal region. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions for Ryan? I mean, otherwise we can get yeah. The tropical cyclones always reset. The big tropical cyclones reset soft bottom stuff within the 30 meter stuff. You know, like seagrass entities and redistributes that sort of sediment around the place yes. as well. And on the coast, the Girabi coast there, we had instruments in the beach there for turtle nests that showed they could take two, three miles, two feet of sand on the beach front and take out the turtle nests. Is I don't have other things apart from redistributing yeah. the beach sediments as well. You just sort of look at the further down. Yeah, no, it's a good point, yeah. So there's other biological effects apart from corals and the solid. Yeah, yeah, I didn't mean, yeah. That's, I mean, a really good point. I think that one of the big applications potentially of understanding really resilient parts of beaches in terms of where you're not going to have these natural erosion events for, you know, turtle nesting and, and and bands, yeah. of course, down the bottom of X Mount Gulf Ridge, who did a whole lot of sediments and killed a lot of mangroves, apart from physical damage. Yeah. They're entirely people to clean up there and have a look, and they just sort of drown the smothers in the metaphors. Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah. On, I don't know, go on up on the East Pilbara case, which went a couple of days my son or the time. Um, it redistributed up sediment to kill all the spat that they had there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's um, So that <coughs> passed down and the major waves came down the Gulf side of the yep. Cape. Okay. What do you think? Do you have any idea of what might have happened if 10 metre waves came down the west side of the Cape? Yeah, I didn't. I mean, the interesting thing, which I didn't get into, is. Um, the damage, of the damage that occurred, it was actually, because the eye went right over Tenabidi and it was, you know, 40 meter per second winds. Mm. And the, the, the most of the erosion was actually caused by the growth of the winds in the, in the lagoon, where we actually, in the lagoon, we had almost one and a half meter waves that were just generated by the local, local winds. And so a lot of the erosion was actually not due to the offshore waves, it was actually due to the, the wind growth. Um, so, so I, I mean, I think even if there was like a, you know, 10 meter waves offshore, I'm not convinced it would have much, yeah, I mean, the reefs really, you know, do, do their job, I guess. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, with the, like, your long, you know, relationship between the turbidity and the cyclones, I couldn't see with the time scale on the x-axis of that. Is that, is there any sort of indication that the effect of cyclones and is increasing? Um, I think the problem is, the only way we can go really back into time is, well, that's another, yeah, the only way we can go back in time with observations um, is with satellite products, and we're still on a limited, you know, 20, 30 years. I mean, the interesting angle, which so Malcolm probably, I think, talked, <coughs> and so we're working with Malcolm as well, trying to take, you know, these times where we have really good modern records, and he can, with using the geochemistry and the coral cores, actually go back two, three hundred years. Um, so, so I think if we can get confidence that we can predict the modern events really accurately, then I think we could, you know, so I think he's seen some trends in the, in the, in the coral cores over the last century or so. Yeah, that was in that first, you talk, yeah, that yeah. first presentation that we had. Yeah, yeah, series, yeah. You know? Oh, well, thank you very much, Ryan. Um, Vince, oh, do you have uh, more? I can just have Alison. If, um, if just in, just introduce, but obviously the word damage, we obviously always use that word when it comes to cyclones, but obviously it's a natural event. Is, have you sort of looked into some of the, if you think about the intermediate disturbance hypothesis and the idea that maybe some of these big events uh, to reset the system or something of that nature, what the need for, even if it sort of smothers reefs and then creates all the best some hard substrate for them to re recruit onto? Uh, have you looked into some of those larger? Not, no, no. Yeah, so I think disturbed. I think we I think we sort of have really over the last couple of years I think have a really good grasp of now the, the physical processes. So I mean I think this could this could be years of probably collaborative work with yeah. with people to look at more the ecological yeah impacts of it. Yeah, yeah. Because there's obviously some upsides of it. There yeah. Might be some associated with it. Yeah, and we've been touch like, with people at the depot and George, George and mm -hmm. others. And, you're talking about. Yeah, link that up. Yeah. 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 Okay, on to Fabio. Oh dear. Wait a minute. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to address here is a classic problem in the management of natural resources, which is how do we uh, set priorities for conservation um, uh, intervention accounting for both the ecological connectivity and uh, population dynamics? While at the same time, we know there is very high natural uh, variability, which is unknown to us, which means double uncertainty here. And the purpose of a conservation in, um, initiative might be diverse. And in fact, one of the main results I'm going to show is that if we think about an ecosystem, uh, an ecological system, the role an area plays in the system might differ considerably if we are thinking about system maintenance versus system uh, recovery, as I will show you soon. So this work is a combination of field work, three types of modeling, oceanographic model, particle tracking, and 
ecological modeling plus some network theory and this is why the list of authors is so long there on the right hand side of the collaborators. So let's start with uh, the field work. There has been uh, more than 1200 transacts carried out over uh, approximately two years in the region. As a result of this work we had uh, an approximate understanding of coral cover in the region as well as uh, a sufficient understanding to suggest to divide the region into 47 zones which are relatively hom homogeneous. Finally, from what we got from this sampling is a, a rough understanding of the quality of the habitat in each region. That means what is the, the uh, potential in each region for color color to uh, potentially increase in the next few years. So we, to this we add um, oceanographical modeling um, forced with real data from the years 2004 to 2009. For each of these six years, the oceanographic modeling has been going for one month, more or less around the time when we uh, expect the major uh, corresponding to occur in the area. In terms, this uh, oceanographic modeling is going to force a particle tracking modeling. And what the particle tracking does is basically to release uh, virtual larvae from more than 3,000 reefs within these 47 zones. And basic, basically allow us to give a rough understanding of the probability that the larvae released from one zone might reach any of the other 47 zones. Um, so basically this what it gives us is the potential for each of the 47 zones to act either as a sink or a source of a larvae. Now, we need to be slightly careful here. When we think about sources or sink, it's kind of natural having the temptation of thinking only one time step. So one larva is released, gets to another reef and uh, recruits there. Now, the simulations are going to show you soon go for 50 years. So we need to think about multiple generations. So we need to think about the larvae going from one zone, say it's on one, to zone four, maybe recruiting in zone four, turning into a new colony we generate more larvae and end up going, for example, to zone 12. So each zone is connected to all the other zones, not just by one step of the connectivity, but of over these intermediate steps that occur through uh, the generation span. So from a network perspective, a better measure of this process is probably what is called between a centrality in network theory that basically says how likely it is that a zone is going to act as an intermediary step into this multi-generational uh, uh, collection. So that map shows the between centralities of each zone uh, under a connectivity matrix which is the mean of the six connectivity matrices from the year 2004-2009. And now we'll show in a couple of minutes what this approximation implies using the mean of the connectivity. So now we have a, a rough understanding of coral biomass, of habitat quality, we have connectivity values, we can set up an ecological model. Now we have a very simple ecological model, single species, logistic equation, but it still allows us to, cal to calculate the internal dynamic of the coral within each zone, uh, density dependence, uh, which is going to be very important for this simulation, <coughs> and then connectivity and a little bit of stochastic noise, noise just to give variability to the process. Now let's not forget that there is one of these equations for each of the 47 zones which are communicating through the connectivity. So even if the equation is quite simple, when you actually run everything together, the simulation becomes extremely complicated. We have coral growing in one zone, receiving larvae from another one. The larvae may or may not recruit according to uh, density dependence and then spread around. So the dynamic becomes very complicated. Now that we have the tool, what I would like to do is study system maintenance mm -hmm. versus system uh, recovery. Now it's for system maintenance, what I um, take as a proxy for this measure is this, uh, we know each zone is going to go through local, potentially short-term perturbations. And how a zone can cope with this perturbation partly depends on how much uh, larvae is going to recruit from all other zones. So this is basically gives a measure of the year-to-year -year support that 
one zone can have over the overall system. Now, it's not easy to calculate this, so the, the way we did it is this. We take the model and we run it for a number of years, and this gives us a amount of biomass over the entire region. And we take this biomass as a ba baseline, which is the dark one now. Now we're going to say, okay, let's suppose that one zone is completely destroyed. So there might be a development in that region that wipes out the uh, carrying capacity for that zone completely. Now we run the model again, and we calculate the biomass over all the region when that zone is not present. We make the difference between the overall uh, biomass, and this difference is telling us how much that zone contributes to the dynamic of, of the overall system, which is different from the biomass that is in that zone specifically. This is how much that zone contributes to the biomass over the, the rest of the system. Now, we carry out this simulation for all 47 zones. We get a mapping like this, where a dark color means high contribution to the rest of the system. Now, system recovery, what I'm trying to do is completely the opposite. So we assume there is a major catastrophic event that goes through the region, kills everything, except for one zone which we have conserved very well. And then we are going to ask how long it's going to take to the system to recover to the uh, baseline we started from. So again, I kill everything except for one zone. Then I launch the simulation again, and I count here how many years it's going to take for the system to recover. And then we plot the result, and we have something like this. So here, dark means faster recovery time, so darker is good. Now, if we put the two maps side to side, side by side, then um, well, it's, it's hard to see from a very small figure, but there are only a few sites, a few zones that have high impact uh, from the maintenance perspective as well as fast um, recovery time. Most of the zones have high potential for either one or the other uh, um, processes. <coughs> So this, I guess this brings to the core result, the first core result from this uh, work, that is zones which offer high contribution for system maintenance do not necessarily provide high contribution to system uh, recovery from major disruptions as well. Now, the simulations I, run, I showed so far are based on a connectivity matrix that come from the mean of the connectivity matrices from the year 2004 to 2009. So the question is, is this mean representative of the variability over those six years? Now, if I plot the between the centrality for the six years individually, uh, we can just visually see in, immediately there is a considerable um, <coughs> difference. And the variability can also be very strong on two consecutive years. So here, 2004, 2005, 2006, you see how much it changes just going over one year. If I now replay the simulation and calculate the, the potential for system maintenance and potential for system recovery using the connectivity from each individual here, we see that again the results are dramatically uh, different. I'm not going to show this now, but this difference is, is statistically um, significant and we have been uh, simulating this to, to actually check. So I guess this brings to the second core uh, result that the mean connectivity over uh, an interval of, of time is not a good approximation of the here, here variability in uh, connectivity. Now, how do we make sense of uh, um, all these simulations? So one uh, way to do it is just to plot them on a 2D plot, so one axis I we plot the potential for high impact, on the other axis the potential for recovery. And then I plot each zone with different colors according to the uh, six connectivity matrices plus the mean one. And uh, it's quite clear there is not much pattern here. It's very hard to uh, de detect anything significant. There is, there are two zones here that have both high impact and very fast recovery time, which is good, but this happens only for two consecutive years. 
On the other hand, um, so this reinforces basically the idea that the zone contribution to system maintenance and system recovery also differ considerably according to the connectivity methods. Now, none of the simulations is really realistic because it would be unlikely, very unlikely, that in the next 50 years the ocean uh, circulation is exactly the same as, for example, in the year 2005. So we expect variability from here to here. So what we have done is uh, um, it would be great to know what is the <coughs> likelihood of each of those connectivity to repeat in the next 50 years. Now, we don't have that information. So what we have done is that we, we took two extreme assumptions. In one case, that is the color, the red one, we assume we just pick randomly for the next 50 years one connectivity metric from the six we have, and we just repeat them randomly. In the other case, that is the green one, we just cycle through the six of them periodically as if that pattern had to be repeated for the next 50 years. Of course, none of them is realistic, but it's better than just assuming that the connectivity metric is fixed over the 50 years. Now we start to see some pattern. The recovery time um, changes dramatically between the random uh, connectivity metrics to the one that cycles periodically. So it's quite clear that if connectivity changes uh, 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 randomly, we are going to have more mixing. The larvae released from one zone might end, end up here, then the next CI, the different connectivity metrics that might end up there. And that allows much mixing and, and allows for much shorter recovery times. The cycling um, distribution of connectivity metrics does quite well as well, but not as well as the random one. And as you see, if we assume the connectivity is always the same, taking the mean, that is the blue, we have recovery times which are on average um, lower. And then we can play games like this. We can say, okay, which one are the zones that have high impact and fast recovery time? And we plot them on the map, which are the red ones. And here, which one are the ones that have very low impact as well as very low recovery time, which are the blue ones. So in theory, we can say, well, the red ones could be a high priority target for conservation initiatives. The blue ones might be the, the ones that have the least uh, cons uh, conservation priority. I wouldn't give much uh, weight to this free zone in Ningalu because that's the border of the domain. So they are going to surely to be uh, border uh, effects on, uh, on this computation here. So I guess this leads to a number of crucial questions. The more important is what is the long-term pattern of ocean <coughs> circulation in the next 50 years because we see how much this can impact the uh, role each zone plays in the system di um, dynamics and of course how likely, well, we know is going to be affected by uh, climate change. It would be nice to know to what a, a extent. Ideally, what we would like to have is a probability dis distribution on different connectivity metrics to occur in the next 50 years. And then, of course, again, the big question is what, if we have a conservation initiative, what is the purpose? What do we concern about? Do we concern about sustainability, resilience, both of them, and this also is going to affect the the results. To me, this sounds very much like a risk assessment coming up with some kind of risk measure of different ocean uh, uh, circulation patterns in the future, what these can mean for the region and how we judge the different uh, risk that this can uh, um, lead in terms of the aims for our conser uh, conservation. And so basically in summary here, so the three main uh, uh, results, the zone contribution to system maintenance versus system recovery can be different. The mean connectivity matrix is not a good representative of connectivity variability and a zone's role changes considerably according to the connectivity matrix. And if we have a decent understanding of these processes, then we can come up with maps like the one here on the bottom right where we have a uh, um, some kind of indication of what zone might be on the high priority list for conservation. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for Fabio? Fabio, I'm assuming you threw that um, bleaching effect we had, the 2013, which hit for the very hard. 
we could plot the areas that using the same shape in and areas, plot the areas that are more likely to be disturbed and then you can overlay that onto this to say if it's if you've got we can make a decision where these are resilient areas to bleaching events, you've got multiple bleaching events. So they're more important to protect, or you can say these are less resilient so we need to protect those and make that management decision based on that recovery likelihood for the model. Yes. So there are two sides here. One is which one is more resilient to the bleaching event. Yes. And the other side is if we protect this, how likely it is that this is going to to be an effective seed yes. to recover in the other region. So these are <laughs> Yeah. Two different things. You yeah. might have a region that is very resilient to bleaching, yeah. but that is to protect that is not going to help the rest of the system. Yes. Yeah. So there are two slightly different issues. I see you've got your, you know the recovery time which are multi-decade or now none of that presumably is saying no recurrent disturbance yep. in that period, whereas in fact that's not going to be realistic. It's a dynamic system that's driven yep. a lot of these physical things, which are cyclones, particularly at a major effect. And I don't think even if you look at the tracks, is that not only the footprints, the intensity, and the speed of the moving is going to be there. So the whole thing probably does hook together, but it's unrealistic to think that anything's going to go back to a particular point when you start sampling in any realistic time. Of course, of course. I mean, under the approximation that uh, I am using, sooner or later, if you let the model go forever, it's, you're going to reach that state. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you all very much for coming along and listening to both Fabio and Ryan. I think they've been fantastic presentations. I should have mentioned it at the beginning, but um, the, this, the whole PMCP program is funded through the Gorgon Net Conservation Benefit um, Program. And that's one of the reasons we're doing these seminars, is, is part of getting these net conservation benefits activated. We're being able to bring the science here and actually talk about how this might be applied for our own management purposes. So in saying that, we're going to have now a follow-on discussion just with a smaller group of managers within Parks and Wildlife. But thank you all for coming. If you have anything else you'd just like to chat briefly with Fabio or Ryan, feel free to so come on up and um, have a chat, but thank you very much.